Hello! I am Anna McNuff, the ambassador for Girl Guiding, and I am so excited to be part of the Girl Guiding Adventures at Home Festival! Now, today I'm going to be doing one of my favourite parts of adventuring, and even better, it is a part of adventuring that you can always do at home, and that is adventure storytelling. I love going on adventures, but what I love more than going on adventures is coming home, writing about them, looking at all the pictures I've taken, thinking about the way I felt, the characters I met along the way, and sharing it with other people so that they can go on their own virtual adventure to where I went to. Now today, the best thing as well is that you don't need anything for this session. All you need is a pair of ears for listening, if you've got those, a pair of eyes for maybe looking, and then just your imagination. So the way it's gonna work is I'm gonna read you a little bit of this story, which is a book called The Pants of Perspective, which I wrote, there's my magical unicorn pants there. I wrote this about a 2000 mile run I did, the length of New Zealand. So I'm gonna read you just a short section of this story. And then after I finish the reading, during which you can just relax, you can chill out, lay down, just listen, let your imagination go. After we finish the reading, I'm gonna set you some challenges. So stay tuned, stay peeled, listen in for the first part, and then get ready to prepare your own adventure story after I've finished. Here we go. So at this point, I'm around about halfway through running this trail, and I am in an area of New Zealand called the Richmond Ranges. And I'm up in this beautiful, beautiful place called Mount Rintel, which is about 1700 meters high, right up in the clouds. And I have woken up this particular morning in a mountain hut in the middle of nowhere with my two trail friends, Finney and Fee. The chapter is called Top of the World. Feet on the floor, McNuff, feet on the floor, let's go. Shimmying out of the toasty warm sleeping bag, I pulled on a jacket, beanie and leggings. Once out of the mountain hut, I tiptoed across the grass towards the toilet. Large droplets of dew freed themselves from the blades as my feet brushed past. I stopped to take in the view. It was beautiful. It was a rare to have the chance to have such a remote area and yet have a window into civilization. We were a four day hike from the nearest town and I felt a mixture of connection and detachment from the life down there, nestled between the pavements and the street lamps, a life I could be leading. As we ate breakfast in our tiny elevated palace near the clouds, I watched the skies come to life through the condensation of the window. The dark navy and violets of dusk gave way to a full pink and orange sunrise, one which lit up the Tasman Bay further to the west. My trail friends, Finney and Fee, left at 7am to get a head start on the day. I rolled around on the floor of the hut for a little bit longer doing stretching exercises and 45 minutes later, I began my own journey up the climb. The trail started in the bush before emerging onto open tops and on a loose scree slope. Scree was always a tall order. It was great fun to come down, scree skiing had become my favourite new pastime, but it was a struggle to go up. It absorbed every last ounce of energy from my steps, heels and toes and even scrambling outstretched hands sinking into the ever shifting surface, causing mini avalanches as I ascended. I hummed the lyrics to the carpenters, the top of the world, as I puffed and panted my way to the top of the ridgeline. The incline eventually gave way to a plateau and I found myself on the ridge that I'd heard so much about. I found myself breathing hard and my legs burning as I turned 360 degrees and a broad smile stretched across my face. It was just beautiful. The weather had held and I could see for miles upon miles. Peaks of every shape and variety stretched as far as the eye could see. Little jagged grey ones, wide round green ones, big proud reddish brown ones, those in the forefront were crystal clear and those further away were just ghostly outlines. I stood for a minute, taking it all in. Every time I blinked and looked again, something new seemed to reveal itself. The ridgeline curved steadily around to the right, but to the left I spotted an orange triangle on a pole, but I couldn't see a second one further on. It made me nervous when I could only see one. I liked to try to second guess where the trail went. The further ahead I could see, the better. For some reason, being able to construct even a shaky and hasty vision of what lay ahead, it just calmed me down. 
I followed the trail to the pole, perched at the edge of a rocky ridge. I thought back to my trail notes and I tossed a jumble of words around in my mind. I vaguely remembered something about choosing to go directly along the ridge or skirting around the slope, but I concluded they couldn't be referring to this section of the ridge, could they? Surely there was no way I was expected to go along this ridge. I looked down to the south slope and I wondered about going that way instead. It didn't seem to be an appealing option either, as the ground dropped away very steeply and was almost all slippery scree. I began to doubt myself. I thought back to the challenges of previous mountain passes and how ridiculous those had felt at the time, and I concluded that the trail could well intend to take me along that ridge line. I took a deep breath, I dropped down onto the heels of my feet and I put my hands out beside me. If I was taking on this route, then I was going to do it by staying as low to the ground as possible, or what little ground there was. I assumed the position of a crab, a very frightened crab with a gigantic backpack on. This was going to take some careful progress. Heart beating clean out of my chest, I edged forward. I moved one foot or hand at a time, stopping to regain my balance in between any progress. The rock dropped quickly away on both sides and I was clambering on something barely wide enough to take my trainers. Three steps out onto the ridge and I spotted two figures in the distance. My friends, Finny and Fee. Silhouetted against the early morning sun, the sight of them reassured me. Thoughts that they'd made it this far, so it must be okay, were followed quickly by wondering how on earth they'd made it that far. My heart beat harder still and I focused my attention on my breathing. Shoving all the thoughts from my mind, I shuffled a little bit further along the ridge. Still one egg, leg or arm at a time, one egg, one leg or arm at a time, and still very slowly. I stopped to catch my breath and decided to turn my head to look down the mountain rather than up and along it because looking along the ridge really wasn't doing as a calming tactic. Just as I looked down, I spotted it. There you are, I said out loud. Five metres down the slope to my right was an orange pole. The next pole, the pole I should have been following. Oh no! The pole is down there. That means I'm not meant to be up here. Up here, all limbs dangling precariously on granite rocks. A realisation that suddenly made everything so much worse. Breathe, Anna. Breathe. I eased myself back in the direction I'd come from. I felt like a bus that had gone the wrong way down a one-way street. Turning around just wasn't an option. The ridge was so narrow that there was only space for one limb on a section of it at a time. What had been a tricky manoeuvre forwards doubled in difficulty in reverse. At one point, I froze solid. You're going to fall, Anna. You're going to fall. Oh, for goodness sake, Anna. Just don't fall. At last, I made it far enough back to a point where I thought it'd be safe to rejoin the mountainside. I locked eyes on the elusive pole below and supported my body weight on two arms, lowering myself onto the scree below. As my feet found the floor, it moved. Ah! I yelped dropping in height as the scree under my feet slid downwards, taking me with it for a little bit. I grasped a solid bit of granite to my left and I watched as a mini rock slide continued below me, gathering up a few larger boulders and sending them tumbling downwards. I heard a call and then an echo. Anna! 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 My name bounced off around neighbouring peaks like a pinball in an arcade game. Playing peekaboo, I popped my head around the side of the granite that I was now clinging to and shouted and waved to Finny and Fee, who'd stopped their hike and were facing in my direction. Hey, I'm here. Oh, there you are, came the reply from Finny. We thought you might have fallen off the mountain, he added in his usual matter of fact tone. I could hear them clear as day, even though they were a kilometre further along the ridge. Nah, you know, I just, um, I thought I'd rearrange the rocks a little bit, you know, I called back, using humour to mask the fact that my insides were now doing somersaults. I'm, uh, I'm going to go down the mountain a bit and round, I ventured. Is that what you guys did? Yeah, that's the way, they hollered back, before turning on their heels to continue along the ridgeline. After a literal rocky start, the poles were kinder from then on. I navigated my way to the section of ridge where Finney and Fee had been standing and found it wide enough to pick up running again. 
A little further on, I came across them perched on an open rock, having a snack. They gave out a little cheer as I approached and I felt like a child running into the arms of her parents. Blimey, I exclaimed, throwing off my pack and dropping down to sit alongside them. That was gnarly. Munching on a square of cheese, I looked around. I could see the Tasman Bay to the west. Atlas-style mountain peaks poked through a blanket of clouds and the sun teamed up with the bluest of skies to frame ghostly outlines of the ranges already run. Scenes of ineffable natural beauty mixed with moments of panic, exhaustion, fear and elation. This, I thought, was surely life at its fullest and the world at its most beautiful. But at the same time, this was also ridiculous. It was mad. Was I really here? Was I really doing this? And I'm going to leave it there. I'll leave me up on a ridgeline somewhere in New Zealand. So if you enjoyed that story, what I would love you to do now is to create your own adventure story. So the way you need to do that is in two parts. The first thing I want you to do, I want you to set a timer for five minutes Okay, and I want you to run around your house as fast as possible. You only got five minutes and collect any item that you have in your possession that you reminds you of an adventure you've once been on or a travel you've taken or a trip with your family and get it all in one place on the floor in front of you. Okay, go and do that. You've got five minutes. Go.
once you've done that, if you've now got all your adventure items in front of you, you've laid them all out, and I want you to think about the memories that are attached to each one of them. So pick one or two items, maybe from a single trip, that really take you back to a point in time. And I want you to try and construct an adventure story around that item from your adventure. Now, when you're writing your adventure story, it doesn't have to be particularly long, but there are a few things that you need to really get in place. The first thing is make sure you tell us where you are. Where are you? How old are you? You know, where in the world are you? What time of day is it? That kind of thing. Make sure you set that up from the start. The second thing is to let us know, are there any other characters in the story? Are you with anyone else? Are you on your own? And then as you go through the story, make sure you mix a feeling of what was happening and how, how you were feeling about the situation. So are you nervous? Are you excited? Are you happy? Are you sad? Mix that in, kind of like a cake mix, with what was actually going on. So you get the mixture of the action, this is what's happening, attached to this is how I feel. You want to try and get those two things in quite equal balance as you go through the story. Now, a really cool thing to do with your story is to try and pick out a really special little detail. So I would use the item that you have, try and weave that into the story. And whatever that is about that item that makes it special, just plant it in the story and describe in great detail about that item and what it meant to you and how it made you feel and where it was used or what was going on. So that's a special little detail. And the final thing is when you're writing your story, remember that you have five senses, okay? It's not just about what you saw, it's also about what you heard, what did you smell, what did you feel on your skin? You know, if you're smelling just stinky siblings or whatever, or if you're eating something delicious, tell us how that feels when you're eating it. Take the reader, the person you're going to tell your story in, into great detail. By the end of all that, you should have yourselves a beautiful adventure story. And then when you retell it, you're going to be able to take someone else on a virtual adventure with you. And that is the beauty of adventure storytelling. Not only do you get to experience the adventure yourself, you actually get to take someone else there with you when you retell that story. So good luck, adventure storytellers. I hope you enjoy yourself. Just go crazy with it. Let your imagination run wild. Take yourself back to that adventure place. And if you have enjoyed this session, make sure you go and watch all of the other sessions as well and share on social media, hashtag adventures at home. Take care, have fun.